there, I was part of a very hostile takeover and I knew I had maybe two years to help with the transition and then I'd be no longer of value. And when I went into the boardroom, John, they had a stuffed eagle on the side. And um, the joke was when a woman reached 50, she's only a stuffed bird. She's an author, an inspirational speaker and a catalyst for change. Uh, when they were building the Jubilee Line extension, and I was fortunate enough to be involved in that project. And when they got by the, um, the main switchboard, there was not any circuit diagram. And they had made old Bill, I can't remember his name, redundant because he'd hit 50. Now, old Bill didn't work from diagrams. It was all in his head. Now they had to bring him back in as a consultant. So there is some poetic justice here at three times what they were paying him to actually explain what the circuit board was. She's currently working on a project that believes in and supports the exchange of knowledge between old and young people. I think what really distresses me is uh, the experience of the elderly is disregarded. This is not only about the elderly. And who makes those decisions doesn't realise sometimes they're taking the kingpin out. This is about embracing life's tapestry. And my guest is Christine Marsh. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, embracing Life Tapestry, I think, is a fantastic title, John. Um, I love the patchwork quilt idea, and you have to embrace the good bits, the bad bits, the tatty bits, etc. And how it all comes together. Nothing's wasted, John, is it, at the end of the day? True, true. Yeah, Christine, you have many years of experience uh, involved in project management. Uh, doing process improvement projects. You also have a lot of experience as a keynote speaker. Would you like to share some of your most memorable experiences with me, please? I think with regards to the project work, I think people found it quite strange because I would go in and research first. I never went in with the solution because I didn't know what the problem was. And often what people were calling you in for and sometimes a senior management with a problem and you had to be able to hold that balance really as an external consultant of truth and honesty and feedback and getting people really to look at different perspectives john um the key thing is i think to keep the open mind and being aware that there's things that are same or similar in any company i've worked with it's where the real differences kick in that we often get conflict. And what are those real differences that you've experienced in process or change management projects? I think it's the gap between a CEO and somebody on the shop floor. Because often they don't come out of their ivory towers and they're making judgments. For example, you will get somebody deciding that uh, return on investment is the important thing. Right. So they will get new suppliers in and, for example, they will change the um, plastic in a bag that's got to be heat sealed without any consultation. The people doing the heat sealing don't know they've changed the specification. Uh, it's too hot. And then when it gets to the end user, it splits. Uh, however, when I got down to the nitty gritty, it's people that have to implement these wonderful plans without often any consultation and they have to mop up. I sometimes feel they did it almost despite senior management's decisions. And then I called it the ROE, uh, which stood for basically my return on my enthusiasm, my return on my effort. You know, I'm coming in. I want to go home feeling I've done a good job. And, you know, it doesn't matter where I'm in the chain. I think if you can get that level of appreciation and participation, you're in with a chance. So it's balancing the ROI and the ROE. And mm. I was with one company. I said, what do you think ROE stands for? Um, oh, return on. Um, uh, and then they come back to money <laughs> where it's the balancing act with the people, really. And I think because I go in 
and I'm perfectly comfortable having worked in operations. They can't pull anything over on me because I can go in and I spot things that, um, you know, you've suddenly got 15 levels of job titles. Why? You know, when a decision's taken and it turns out to keep people happy, the previous managing director used to give them a pay rise and give them another title. So no decisions were ever made because they, what do they call it? Lobbing it over the wall to the next guy. Nothing to do with me. It's their fault. So this cohesiveness is really what I'm all about. I do remember one person saying one time to me, and that person was a former HR manager in Aer Lingus, which is now a part of, you know, International Airline Group with British Airways. And what she said was that, when it comes to change programs, the people at the furnace effectively are the ones who feel the heat most, the people who are at the operational level, not the people in the middle or at the senior level. It's the people that, the customer facing people effectively are the people who feel the heat most when it comes to change. Has that been your experience in life? I think if they're not consulted and it's getting this, what impact would that have if we did this? For example, I was called into one company and they'd had a 24% increase on dealing with um, incomplete um, membership forms. It was a petrol station. You wanted, you know, your fleet to go in and get their petrol and charge it. And suddenly there was a 24% increase and they wanted more staff to deal with the increased workload. And then they said, well, look, we don't quite know what Christine does, but she sorts things. Don't know what that's like for a logo. But you go in and you say, when did it start? You know, has this suddenly happened? And what changed at that time period? And it was marketing. And what marketing had decided in the bottom of the form, it had three letters, P-T-O. What does that mean to you, John? P-T-O? Turnover, I suppose. Okay. Now, when you're dealing multiculturally... PTO has no meaning whatsoever, right? So because marketing said that, that's actually quite demeaning for our customers, take it off. What was happening, the forms were coming in with the front filled, but the back wasn't. So the 24% increase was due to a marketing decision with no understanding of their client base. And then we had a meeting to say, what would you put instead that was international? And all the variations on the theme was really funny. And somebody said, one of one, no, one of two. And then, uh, you know, they came up with a solution because that had to go transcend, if you say the culture. I love working internationally because, you know, you have all the different attributes of um, precision or, yeah, it'll be okay, we'll get by the laissez-faire view of the world. So I've traveled all over and I love human beings because at the end of the day, um, it's friendships that get you through, John. It's people who will go that extra mile for you, but you have to treat them with some kind of respect. And if you don't do that, then, you know, you can come. Um, people I know will deliberately sabotage stuff. Doesn't that sound dreadful? True, true. I know what you're saying there. I do remember many years ago, and personal experience I can talk about from the change program perspective, oh. where 10 of us were sent off to Cumbria from London for three days on part one of a management development course. Right. And the HR director was there and he sat us all down at a table and he said, you've got two years to start making decisions. If you don't, I'm going to sack you. Ah, all of a sudden sorry. you could see everybody in the room, their whole body language tensed up. <laughs> And that was kind of making people, you know, feel guilty or bad about themselves. And eventually that change program kind of, it became very personal. And the, the, the CEO had no choice but to dismiss the HR director eventually because he just took things far too far with people. People were burnt out. They were stressed. They were demotivated. There was no enthusiasm for change at all because he just drove people too hard. The one phrase I do love is what change is inevitable, right? That's happening now. It's such a speed. It's scary, especially for the younger generation and the older generation. This this sort of age line 
uh, can make it very, very difficult. But change is inevitable. You know, AI, goodness knows what that's going to mean. I'm sort of sitting there thinking, do I really want to learn all this stuff? Well, yeah, you have to if you're going to keep with it. Um, stress is manageable. Now, stress is the body's reaction to when you see yourself needing to take action. What we were never meant was to have that in a constant state of stress. Something came up, you dealt with it. Often that wasn't happening in companies. It was just building and building and building. And then the bit that I really found was when I said misery is optional. And this one guy I was dealing with a company. We had about 120 people going through. A French company had taken them over. And, oh, it was a huge cultural shift. And when I said misery is optional, he did swear, actually said, it ain't around here, Christine. It's blankety blank, mandatory. <laughs> That we're all miserable. And I go in the morning and say, right, it was a totally messed up date and day's a new day. And they would say, what's the matter with you? You know, how, how can you not see how disastrous this is? So, yeah, misery. I think we've got into a stage of people moaning and groaning and the negativity and the spitefulness that goes on. It's really distressing, John. People want to do a good job. I think as human beings, we... Our intentions are there. Something happens along the way where we kill that off. You mentioned that you've travelled the world and have been involved in many change programmes. From a cultural perspective, what countries would you regard or what nationalities would you, would you, would re, would you regard as being the most open to change oh. in the workplace? Um, I find in India, uh, the youngsters... They are hungry for knowledge. They're delight to work with. And they're going to run rings around us, to be honest. You know, it's no demarcation factor that we're dealing with. That's your job or this, whatever. It's give me knowledge. I'm hungry for knowledge. And they soak it up and then they go and do something with it. They're delight to work with. Um, Germany, uh, if it's not signed off, can be a little bit rigid. The UK is such a mess at the moment. I don't know what culture we are, to be honest. Uh, but it's it's really looking at what conditioning we've had. You know, uh, we come into the world, I believe, full of intuition and joy and naivety. And I've never really grown up, John, the day I do, you know, put me under. But I think this this lovely, joyous innocence of of exploring and not being frightened to take risks that gets hammered out of us we're either tick box on an application or we don't get the job and i think what's got me because um obviously with my age group a university from female wasn't even an option so what i said you know all my experiences come through learning the hard way and trying to pass on some of those lessons if you can but everybody's got their own learning curve at the end of the day, John. You know, you can read a book and then you put them in a charge of a production line and they upset the production line and productivity goes down. So it's not rocket science. I think it's treating people with respect. Uh, there's a degree of tolerance because we will make mistakes if we're trying something new. Just how much can you bear that to actually go without wrecking the company? But certainly, I, I, my fear was the written word. I can talk, as you can tell. I love interacting with people. And get, put me in front of 200 people and I'm in my element. But ask me to sit and write a book. I avoided that for decades. And that was the judgment call that you couldn't interact. What was on the page, if you'd made a mistake, which I did in my own book, um, I think it was one letter on page 80 and it should have been in and I'd written is. And this senior guy who I used to work for, him, Christine, get a proper editor. I said, pardon. He said, I said, oh, you've got to page 80 then, have you? He said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, one letter, but it proves you've read the other 79 pages. So I can live with that. And that's the book you're talking about there, is it? Life's Choices. <laughs> you enjoyed that. Thank you for your review, John. I really appreciated that. Yeah, I think it was a wonderful book because it's very well uh, prepared and uh, uh, printed. I love the colouring in the book. 
it's very intuitive and I am an intuitive personality more than, an, than a sensory personality. So it suited me to the ground to read it, you know, bit by bit. And it told a great story in the end that we all have a life choice that we either accept change or we have to face up to the reality that somebody's going to push us out of our comfort zone and force us to change, which is a much harder process, I think. Just going back there to uh, demographics, we're talking about there about Germany, the UK, India, for example. And one thing we're seeing in the world economy now, for example, is that Japan would be a great example of it. Less so Germany to an extent, but where you have aging populations, particularly in Western Europe and Japan. And then you have, if you take the Schultz government in Germany, the, the, the traffic light coalition, the Greens, the Social Democrats, and the Liberal Democratic Party. They're trying to make it easier to get people to move to Germany, skilled workers, that is, from Africa or from the Asian countries. But what they're meeting with is resistance in terms of xenophobia, particularly in the eastern, in the old East Germany states. Um, that could be a threat to those economies unless they really embrace change but then you have countries such as uh, South Korea, India, with younger populations. They're fast moving up the world order in terms of global economy size. So I think there's a big threat to those Western European economies. Unless they really embrace change and a more open culture, they could come unstuck sooner rather than later. That's my opinion. I think what really distresses me is uh, the experience of the elderly the older generation whatever you want to call us um is disregarded and the family units are breaking down actually put the oldies into some retirement place and they won't cause us any trouble sell the house and spend the money i'm getting a bit cynical sorry in my old age myself but i think what i am getting involved in is a second book which is going to be called later life's choices and right. i think by 1928, the um, sorry, 2028, go back, Christine, you're in retro. Um, the percentage of people over 65 is scary. It really is. And what I feel not allowing the knowledge to be exchanged, the youngsters learn, but the elderly learn from the youngsters. And you used to have that family unit. And India still very much the grandmother is honored. Whereas here, you know, well, I worked there. I was part of a very hostile takeover and I knew I had maybe two years to help with the transition and then I'd be no longer of value. And when I went into the boardroom, John, they had a stuffed eagle on the side. And um, the joke was when a woman reached 50, she's only a stuffed bird. And, you know, 50... I knew if I was going to start my business, when I got to my 50th birthday, I'd better have plan B. And I'd already got prime objectives. I felt I was in the prime of life. And I felt that my experience, I would be of more use externally on looking at people's objectives because I didn't rely on my paycheck. And I think it's sad when people feel threatened that they can't speak up. And they can't contribute because their job could be at risk. That's a, a sad reality of many countries and many industries where you have, I suppose you could call it a top-down management uh, culture, where the people at the top are very dominant and everything, you know, is communicated downwards, but they don't accept feedback. And I do remember many years ago uh, where... A company I worked in, they were bringing in these uh, single status employment contracts. Okay. And one day we had to go off to a hotel, the management team, and the team, the senior management team talked about the features of the new employment contract. And I put my hand up at the end of the day and I said, we've talked about the features. Tell me, what are the benefits to the organization and to the individual employee? They have no answer. Yeah, it, it is uh, I sort of bridging that um, gap. But I think one of the things, when do you decide to jump? You've had enough. 
Now, sometimes you're pushed. Redundancy, when my husband was made redundant, we had two small children. This is going back. And I mean, it was disastrous. It's part of life's tapestry now, isn't it? This job shift and things happening. And it's going to get a, a real thing for the younger generations of, well, what's the point? You know, th this loyalty to your employer is not two way anymore. And you get used and abused. That's me getting a little bit cynical. But if you're no use, you're out the door. And who makes those decisions doesn't realize sometimes they're taking the king pin out. Uh, the funniest example was uh, when they were building the Jubilee Line extension. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in that project. And when they got by the um, the main switchboard, there was not any circuit diagram and they had made old Bill, I can't remember his name, redundant because he'd hit 50. Now, old Bill didn't work from diagrams. It was all in his head. Now, they had to bring him back in as a consultant. So there is some poetic justice here at three times what they were paying him to actually explain what the circuit board was. And it's what can you put in a manual and this inherent knowledge that people have gained over the years that they take for granted, but anybody trying to follow their footsteps. I know AI is going to be one of the things I have to come to uh, face and see it. Can I use it? Would it be a time waster or, you know, how do I work with this tool? But just to reject it, um, I'm very precious about what I think. And that's why I self-publish my own book, uh, because I had to fulfill the vision I had in my head of what the book would look like. And by the time it got to the editor and graphic designer, I'd already designed the layout. You know, that that's something I really wanted to look like that. And as you know, I took the elements and we took fire and focusing on one situation, regurgitating your intuition, the feel good, this feels right no matter what. If, if it's new, John, I had to remember I was often in a majority of one. If you're ahead of the game, you ain't going to be part of the gang. You can't, you know, you're, you're breaking new ground, rekindling your dream and then energization is stop talking about it, get on and do it. So the whole fire theme of that book really is um, transformational. You mentioned there about AI and happened to dabbled too much into it myself yet, uh, Christine, to be honest. Uh, I'm slightly apprehensive about AI to an extent. Now, I don't mind using something like chat GPT to do some research and put words together around uh, articles I want to prepare myself for the future. But I'd be a bit concerned about where you see it at the moment, where people are uh, publishing videos that are recorded using uh, AI technology, it's not their actual voice or face you're seeing on a YouTube video. It's an AI replication of their face or voice. And there's talk about the fact that your your own voice could be stolen and people could record videos using your voice. So I think there's a danger to some extent in some of these AI applications. I'd love to see more control around it. That's my own personal opinion. Yeah. I think with education as well, you know, when you're submitting your paper, is it your own research? Is it something you struggled through and you've reached your conclusion? Or do you just go and tap in, you know, give me data on whatever? Um, so the younger generation is something from sort of embracing life's tapestry. I think COVID um, stunted the growth, I think, of a lot of our young talent. And that does upset me. But where can we give that youth their opportunity? Because as I say, India is just gobbling it up. Anything that I just love it. You know, I will have friends there that I've made over 20 years um, that are real friends who I trust. Um, they respect my opinion and it's a mutual exchange. But, you know, I'm past my sell by date, according to some people being in retail. What was it? Sell buyers, you're, you're no longer effective or desirable. Now, that's a bit much, isn't it? You know, I mean, I'm chunking my way through the decades and uh, I've learned, but it's not linear, John. It really isn't linear. 
you think, well, I've learned that, move on. You don't, you make the same mistakes and you think, I can't believe I've come circular back to that. And sometimes we just get redunked in disasters. What inspires you most to be successful in life, Christine? I think a genuine belief that you have something to offer. And I've been in some very dark places whereby my employer didn't see the value in me. And I think it's having the courage to go into that dark place. And what is it they say? Um, something about in order to have light, you have to burn. Sounds a bit dramatic, but I think if you've had that baptism of fire, um, you 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 have to come back to yourself. Do I honestly believe that what I'm doing is going to be of value? A great answer. I know, I know what you're saying there. You know, for many years, I did work myself as an accountant, which you know, obviously, about. Uh, but I never, really, I never really kind of enjoyed the work. And I often questioned to myself, was I in the right profession? And then one time I was made redundant. I decided then to change career path to become a career coach and professional speaker. And to be quite honest, it happened look back since. And I do believe the work I'm doing now for the past couple of years has been of great value to people. And I hope to continue in that vein. I think what I really love is, I know you've had some really, really senior people, but I think this Embracing Life Tapestry, you're opening it up to people with such a, a variance of um, experience. And I think all of us would like to contribute. So I really appreciate your invitation, John. You're most welcome, to be honest, Christine. And one final question for you. If you were given the opportunity to make one single request that would be granted without question, what would that be? Oh, that's a biggie, isn't it? Never judge a person's ability unless they've had the opportunity to learn. That's a fantastic answer.